Hello, my name is Mike Liebel. I'm the Director for Clinical Pharmacy Services here at Houston Methodist Hospital. I'd like to spend some time today to talk with you about some of the advancements that we are making at Houston Methodist in coordination with some additional technologies uh, to make things happen faster uh, with clinical decision support. Before we continue, I'd like to address any conflicts of interest. Uh, again, I have no uh, real or perceived conflicts of interest related to the content of the presentation today. However, I am a user of the application we will talk about in Houston Methodist does uh, use these uh, tools that we will talk about today in brief. Before I go too far, I want to make sure I acknowledge an important uh, individual within Houston Methodist Hospital uh, system that uh, advances the section, or excuse me, the um, IT elements in Houston Methodist, Dr. Nicholas Desai. He's our Chief Medical Officer at Houston Methodist Hospital and has contributed greatly to the content of the presentation today. Our agenda today will cover several elements of teaching. We want to review gaps in current clinical care and where tools that are in place today have had gaps um, to support the actual care of our patients. We will review the integration solutions that we have used and how we implemented those at Houston Methodist while describing some of the initial outcomes from those integrations and in pilot programs. In closing, I'll address some future directions and some lessons learned that I hope might help uh, listeners to this uh, presentation take some of the information and apply it to their setting. In terms of learning objectives, we will describe a number of clinical and financial benefits uh, to the decision support uh, software that were implemented and the process of the care changes that were implemented. We will discuss how Houston Methodist is using clinical surveillance to support high-value care and describing some of the challenges that we face when integrating these solutions. I will share some return on investment data, how some of the outcomes have resulted in cost avoidance, but more importantly, the talk today will focus on efficiency gains and how uh, simplicity and efficiency have improved the quality of the provider experience at Houston. Before any discussion on technology, it is very important to set the stage for where this application is being applied and what some of the other uh, tools that are available within the use setting uh, so that uh, their applicability might be considered by the listener. Houston Methodist is a seven hospital system, including one long-term acute care hospital. We have a number of emergency care centers throughout the Houston Methodist region with 13 global locations around the world. We include an institute of research at Houston Methodist as an academic center. There are comprehensive medical, pharmacy, and nursing residency training programs at Houston Methodist, and we see about 107,000 hospital admissions annually and performing about 2,200 operating uh, beds at the facility. We have 6,700 affiliated physicians and 675 employed primary care specialty physicians who we leverage to often beta test certain elements to our uh, enhancements uh, and changes in protocol. Houston Methodist has a wide range of technology uh, that we incorporate at the system level. Uh, so a number of different programs. At the hospital level, there are certainly data and cost accounting systems, CRG encoding software, and other informational technologies such as up-to-date AURP for laboratory data, APRIS Health. Um, we are part of Data First. We incorporate software packages such as Vigilant and Dynamed Plus. On the right-hand side of the graphic, you we will see some of the users that interface with all of these software applications, and ranging from hospitalists, specialists, obviously nurses and other healthcare providers, and certainly the surgeons uh, that interact with these software applications. Where do they interface with these applications? Certainly in the patient care areas across a number of different subspecialty zones, including the medical ward, the ICUs, our emergency department, but also in our ambulatory care and in our specialty units. 
what we want to do is try to provide a interface with all of these applications so that the right information is provided to the right provider at the right time. And I'll talk more about that uh, later. But as you can see from this simple graphic, there are so many applications that a provider must interface with from the technology perspective, it can become overwhelming. That particular element of uh, confusion and just a, uh, different software applications certainly contributes to the experience of a physician or other healthcare providers as not being a satisfactory and enjoyable one when you're trying to take care of patients. And that's no um, more clearly identified than in the physician burnout metrics that we started to see uh, popping up in the literature, where 50% of doctors report at least one symptom of burnout. But among those, 87% are claiming that administrative or clerical work tied closely to the ER, EHR. Again, 75% of reports uh, reporting that they had increased time uh, to document and to report in the EHR, and that increases the time it takes to render care to patients, and that certainly is frustrating for providers. Emergency department providers specifically spend 44% of their time doing data entry. Again, an element that, um, if reduced, would certainly improve the patient experience, but also the provider experience at the same time. This notion of physician burnout certainly has reached the medical literature. And one of the things I often will trend is the number of published papers on a particular subject to see how much interest there is and how much investigation is happening. And as you can see, when that paper, uh, when the discussion about uh, physician burnout was discussed in 2016, we saw a soaring number of papers published on the idea of physician burnout. And again, focusing simply on physicians with this example of published papers, but the idea of physician of burnout is uh, making its way into all of the disciplines from pharmacy to nursing to other healthcare providers. What's contributing to that and where are we trying to go with our experience as a provider using different electronic sources and taking care of patients? As we know in healthcare, the movement on the left-hand side in terms of increasing volumes of patients, increasing volumes of admissions. We want more productivity out of the existing staff that we have taking care of patients. But we also want high levels of quantity, making more of those activities coming through. We often find ourselves being reactive to patients showing up the door, data elements being coming available, and just being really responsive, but in a reactive sense. And that can be frustrating, certainly, to a provider. In terms of healthcare costs, there certainly is, with all of the moving parts related to the cost of care, some element that there's just a lack of awareness of the cost. With so many other elements to keep track of, understanding what the actual cost is of a particular treatment or uh, test, may be the third or fourth thing that a provider really wants to think about. And if it's more difficult to find that information, then they certainly will not incorporate that into their decision-making process. All of those elements, I think, together lead to a situation where burnout is likely possible. What we're striving for is moving those needles to the right. We want to move from an idea of just volume, volume, volume to value, making sure that our patients and our organizations are producing and providing true value uh, to the individual take, get, being cared for. We'd like to move from the concept of quantity to really quality. What's making the experience the best for the patient, the best outcomes of care? Moving from an idea of reactiveness to being proactive, how can we better manage situations we know will happen and with foresight address those ahead of time? Uh, certainly a much more enjoyable frame of mind to be in than being reactive. In terms of cost, we are asking providers to be con cost conscious. We're asking consumers and patients to be cost conscious as well, and they certainly will be. What we're needing are abilities to 
share that information so that a individual, a provider, can be cost conscious within the framework of their day. Lastly, we really want to move the needle from a provider that's being burned out and just making it through the day to someone that's truly engaged in the care of their patients and in the advancement and growth of the organization with which they practice. One of the ideas that Houston Methodist started several years ago was this concept of tying it together, allowing transparency, but at the same time creating interoperability and between those two things, addressing some additional efficiency. By tying it together, we wanted to make it easier for physicians to practice at Houston Methodist and allowing them to return their focus of care to the patients. On the right-hand side, we are looking for the right information to coincide and be presented to the right providers, but certainly at the right time. I think this graphic is important because each of those elements in the diagram, the Venn diagram, happen, but they don't always intersect at the exact point when you need it and when you can make the most benefit from the information. And I'll share some examples of that as we move forward. So again, addressing some of these gaps where our workflows and our data streams haven't intersected to provide us the opportunity to provide the best care. So let's talk a little bit about what faster means in terms of clinical decision support. We really want to realize that value, okay? When we talk about something being faster, that's great, but is it a situation of hurry up and wait, where we have the information, but then nothing can be done with it? And we're going to go through a couple of case examples about that. But in medication speak, in my focus of practice, we do have faster medications. Um, we have faster throughput and verification steps to move procedures and processes through more ra rapidly. We have access to faster diagnostics, and then we can respond more quickly in our processes of care with more efficient bureaucratic steps uh, to help make rules and things more faster within an organization. So let's talk about the value of faster medication pharmacodynamics and if we are achieving that value. <clears throat> there are a couple of drug categories where we certainly have faster responsiveness. Newer paralytic agents and reversal agents are the classic example where medications have onset and they have offset that are very fast. But if the healthcare structure that surrounds the patient does not allow the organization to capitalize on that faster reversal of a paralytic or the faster induction of a, med a medication for paralysis, then we really are not achieving value. We may just be increasing our cost if those faster agents are not as uh, cost or are more costly on the acquisition side than the more traditional or the slower. Agents. Again, achieving values sometimes uh, unable to be attained because we can't move the procedures of care to align with those faster pharmacodynamics. When we talk about faster medication verification and throughput, every discipline that cares for patients would like to be faster. They would like to do their work quicker so that they can move the process of care along and hopefully make the patient experience more quick and more efficient. But with that interest in moving more quickly, we cannot forget about safety considerations and we don't want to compromise safety for speed. That's where different activities that we've introduced at Houston Methodist over time have allowed us to become faster, but also have a safety net with what we call layered alerting strategies to ensure that some of these safeguards, even if you're moving quickly through a verification step, are helping to protect the patient and ultimately protect the uh, provider professional because of safety nets built into the structure. 
we looked at this approach a number of years ago, and the outcome was that these layered alerting strategies, and our tool was a rules-based alerting engine looking for about eight to 10 key variables in situations that if the verifying pharmacist offended those situations, the alert would fire only after the situation was present where the verification step should not have been promoted or advanced. And what we looked at objectively were the number of times that these alerts triggered across a series of time, again, same number of alerts, same conditions being set. And what happened was what we did when we intervened and we started to present these alerting outcomes in direct time sequence as when they happened within a minute or two of the pharmacist making the verification, they were notified that they had overstepped the condition and were made aware of that. What we saw as an outcome was that direct learning activity aligned with the act of making the verification changed the behavior of those pharmacists over time, and we saw a reduction in the number of alerts um, once we had done our intervention and were making those staff aware of the verification missteps that they had in their process. So the layered alerting system not only protected our patients from receiving a potential therapy for which they had not yet been appropriately monitored or appropriately dosed, but it also taught the pharmacist in the moment so that they did not perpetuate that behavior or that type of activity in the future. And we felt that this was a very powerful uh, instrument in our medication safety process to ensure that we had safe effective verification, but also we responded very fast to a situation where the pharmacist had mistakenly verified an order inappropriately. And I'll remind the group that, again, where traditional alerting systems, such as drug and dose checking within the traditional EMR, um, were still in place the entirety of this study period, it was just the addition of that layered approach where you went outside of the traditional alerting system to alert a secondary person to address a, a potential concern. And that, again, was part of the hallmark for the finding of reduction in adverse event uh, potential. When we talk about faster diagnostic, um, this is becoming evident every day where greater technologies are allowing decisions and data to be available much more quickly. Um, one great example of this is the multi-talk uh, technology for identification of microbacteria. When we talk about data being available, um, there's always that question that if a data element is available but no one is around to observe it or act on it, did it really make a difference that that data was available that much more quickly? And the answer obviously is no, um, particularly if the data needs to be acted upon. And that was really the finding in the hallmark of the study that was done at our institution a number of years ago, leveraging alerting systems that brought information to the right provider timely so that decisions could be made without over-alerting uh, individuals. And I'll orient you to this particular case example. Um, so the multi talk software rapidly identifies bacteria species beyond what traditional culturing would do years ago. So it certainly reduced that lab value turnaround time. But that value was not realized in our patients without the underlying supporting structure that data element being available did not translate into patient benefit unless people were alerted outside of the EMR that the right expertise of the individual receiving the information was leveraged and that there was appropriate and responsive follow through through a series of orders and action steps, including the EMR. 
what we saw in our traditional process on the graphic to the right was that, again, a blood culture is drawn with that first node. As the culture turns positive, it took a while for it to grow on the media and then be identified. And ultimately, the last node is that therapy is adjusted after a uh, provider is made aware of the information. During the intervention period, we were able to reduce the amount of time between nodes two and three that it took to grow the solid media, but also pay very close attention to the time it takes between nodes three and five. That's really where the system was able to be addressed and the underlying support structure addressed that reduction in responsiveness. And the value we realized by introducing this process was certainly a reduced time to appropriate treatment, and we reduced the percentage of patients without appropriate treatment both at 24 and 48 hours significantly. That translated into reductions in length of stay, reductions in cost for patients that were hospitalized during the study period. Lastly, while the original study was done at our academic campus, the process is scalable. We reproduced these findings within our collection of community hospitals across Houston Methodist, where, again, there were fewer staff on site 24 hours a day, but through a call system and uh, educational plan, the same types of outcomes were replicated in a community hospital setting. Ultimately, what we did to have success with this program was tied in a faster laboratory technology to a fast and reliable information transfer to the responsible clinician, again, an individual that could interpret the information and take action. We had established policies and procedures that allowed the pharmacist as a extension of the provider to take steps to address the need for the patient ahead of time, so being proactive. And then lastly, there is a validation step within the EMR, readily available access to the EMR to configure orders where needed, as well as validating that the order that was entered and it was dispensed and administered timely. All of these steps resulted in the benefits that we saw with this process change. Shifting gears, let's talk about integration solutions in the implementation process and what's key there. Software applications in and of themselves are good, but certainly bringing the information and tying that information together within a platform that a provider uses most regularly was key. The examples that I've shared before this point all incorporated a secondary outlet of technology where you had to kind of go out into another application where my parent application that I am in most of the time as a provider, the EMR, uh, was not revealing those alerts and those uh, notifications. This Illumicare ribbon brings those applications together and houses them within the view that I have as a care provider in my daily workflows, which allows me to get the greatest benefit from all of the nuanced technologies that are very highly subspecialized, but bring them into the view of a platform that I use every day. And for those pieces of data that are the right information, they are maybe provided, but not to the right providers, and they may not be timely. I can't see them unless I go out to that third-party application and find them or search them out. What the Illumicare ribbon does is brings that information that I want to see as a provider to a platform that I use every day in the normal process of care for my patient. That approach allowed us to bring cost information directly to the provider, again, bringing awareness to and cost transparency to the provider taking care of our patients. What studies nationally will say is that 
72% of physicians consider data valuable in terms of cost, but they don't always have access to it. And that is no different at Houston Methodist Sugarland Hospital, where we conducted a primary pilot of the Illumicare technology, bringing price and cost transparency to the provider. Our physicians clearly stated that they do believe that costs are important and that if they had information about those costs, they would incorporate them into their practice. So by introducing the ribbon and providing that outlet and that information to the provider, the question became after and during the pilot, how often are you accessing the information? Do you do that regularly or sometimes or never? And again, the vast majority were accessing the ribbon very frequently and often. One objective measure to determine whether the providers were actually keeping the information accessible and readily available was what we call the ribbon uptime for the provider. So a measure of how often did the provider leave the tool available to them or did they silence it and send it away because they never wanted to see it. A great number of the providers were leaving the ribbon or the tool active so that they would access it and make themselves available for those nudges, those alerting that provided opportunities for them to be aware of cost opportunities for savings, reductions in laboratory, um, duplicate therapies, et cetera. So when measuring the benefits this particular approach, one of the analyses that were done was looking at a pre-ribbon period versus a post-ribbon access period. And I'll orient you to this graphic where we focus first on laboratory costs. So in the blue, we have the daily cost of care for the patient and normalized to a average. And in the green, it shows once the ribbon was made active and alerts were provided to providers, access to information about costs were made available to providers, uh, alerting on duplications of laboratory tests of potential medication alterations to reduce costs were made available to providers through the activation of the ribbon. And what we saw with our laboratory costs was a, a slight reduction in that particular scope of cost and care for our patients. Looking at radiology costs, the signal is a little less strong, but still there in terms of a slight reduction in the number of x-ray tests, et cetera, that were done for patients pre and post ribbon. Where my particular focus is on medication costs as a pharmacist, we saw a more dramatic reduction there have been clear reductions in costs associated with the awareness of providers to cost information and slight nudges that a provider may get in terms of an opportunity for moving from a more expensive to a less expensive. Those three data elements uh, taken together have resulted in a cost per admission reduction of about 5% at our Houston Methodist Sugarland facility where the pilot was conducted during those intervals of study. We think that's uh, a relevant uh, and important uh, opportunity uh, to justify the investment in time and energy and a, uh, if you will, screen space for the platform uh, to have providers interact with it. While those costs are relevant, um, I believe one of the greatest benefits from these tying it together in, the, in technologies and integrations relate to clinical review efficiency. Um, and there's no greater example of the benefit today that we have seen than with the PDMP database uh, for controlled substances and narcotic um, uh, prescription awareness. The, Prescription data monitoring program data is required to be reviewed by providers prior to prescribing an outpatient order for uh, targeted narcotic medications and medications of substance abuse potential. That process required providers 
on average, to make about 12 clicks and type in several data fields to search a patient and to enter their data into the search engine. It took about 60 seconds for the data to be returned after doing all of that uh, work. And then after you put the information in, the match rate was only about 85%. Um, so you might have done some of that uh, work in error. What the PDMP is doing for potentially folks listening that are not physicians or pharmacists, the Prescription Drug Launching Program is one of the efforts to address the opioid, opioid crisis and address some more transparency for all providers so that they can identify uh, potentially uh, patients who might be moving between providers to attain medications uh, they should not. So the databases begin to connect pharmacy dispensing data on the left and healthcare providers on the right, but it's using lots of data inputs from the pharmacies and the orders that prescriptions that providers submit. That information then is provided to licensing boards to address um, pharmacists who may not be uh, doing due diligence in their prescription dispensing. It may be provided to boards of medicine for addressing providers who may not be doing their due diligence in assessing patients for risk of dependency. And then obviously for law enforcement if there are diversion issues, et cetera. But coalescing all that data together and actually using it when you need to at the point of care for a patient is a daunting task, particularly if you have to integrate that into your workflow in a third-party application. What the Illumicare application does and how it's tied together for our Houston Methodist, that ribbon being available in this example on the bottom shows that on the controlled substance or the PDMP alert, I have a report available for this patient. Then I get my illumination or my pop-up that says that there was a report found. No longer did I have to go out and find the information and type it in. The information was, when available, presented right there for me to review. All I need to do now is click on it and see what the information shows. When I click on that illumination or that pop-up, what I get is exactly what I would see if I were to go seek out that information through our Texas State Board of Pharmacy uh, website or others. And I did not have to make 12 clicks. I did not have to type in manually any data. The application knew which patient I was looking at and it went out and gathered that information. So now I can make an informed clinical decision about the information that's presented. When we looked at the ribbons available complement of applications, in green, you see the controlled substance app for inpatient care users was one of the highest lay leverage tools in the ribbon. When we looked objectively at how long it took or how quickly, I should say, the application was called up, it eliminated those clicks and the retrieval time was less than two minutes but it also has a match rate that was very high. So there was high confidence that the right patient it was calling out for was the patient's information. We found that the nudge was very important. So the element of actively alerting or popping up this information was related to accessing this information in the ribbon and for our patients. There was a period where we deactivated those active notifications and those features were suppressed. Um, and what we were able to see was that during that interval, there was a reduction in the count of searches for the PDMP during that time frame. When we returned to active nudging or active notifications, those uh, number of searches returned to where they were before. The second element of alert efficiency enhancement relates really to our pharmacy surveillance and integration. I told the story earlier of our workflow processes for safety 
in order verification. And we talked about this story for in our experience with the MALDI-TOF application for antibiotic uh, and infection control management. What I will show you is how we've been able to, through these ribbon applications, bring the benefits of our vigilant application into the day-to-day -day workflow of the pharmacist in the EMR. So we bring the value of real-time alerting platform <clears throat> and all of those benefits into <coughs> our EMR day-to-day -day work. Similar to the PDMP ribbon, I have my Vigilans application. And when I'm inside a patient's profile, now I am accessing alerting that I have high-level reporting for my patient. So I can see that I have an activation that is illuminated and I see on the ribbon that there is a uh, alert that I can call out for this patient that I'm looking at. Within one click, I get to the alert available for this patient. I can see that I have an opportunity to convert a patient from IV to PDO with a specific drug. And from that point, I can do a couple of things. I can see if I was unsure what the actual alert related to, there's an expanded definition and opportunity to learn more about that particular alert. Within the application also, I can call out to the parent tool. So I can go out into the Vigilance application at this point and see a greater depth of information and not just the uh, initial data sets that are presented within the Illumicare ribbon. At this point, I can document more uh, completely if I needed to. I can search more information about the rule and about the alerting that I am seeing. Within the application, I can easily acknowledge the alerting and it's writing back to the application so that I don't have to go out into that third-party application again it's all being done from my activity within this ribbon element. I've acknowledged it, and I can move on. Once I make that acknowledgement, the alert goes away, and again, I'm left with only the alerts that remain for the patient and um, and I can close out this particular patient when I called them up for my clinical review using the EMR, I can also address all of the alerting that have been done outside of the EMR platform. This was a great advance for us, but the other element that we were missing was, again, our pharmacists were saying, I, in addition to having very patient-centric and patient-specific alerting, I'd like to see all the patients that I'm following in a geographic area, or maybe I want to see all the patients in the hospital that have a particular rule that I am uh, following or trending as a subspecialist in infectious diseases or oncology. And that's where the work list application uh, came into play for us. So again, it's using Vigilance as the background source, but the enhancement is that I can call out a different geographic area, be that a different hospital within my system structure, or even within that hospital, a series of units that I have particular interest in. And what I'm now seeing is a list of all activations and all rules that I have alerting within that geographic region, uh, again, given some of the parameters of filtering that I might want to achieve. And so I can sort this grouping by uh, any of the headers by alphabet, and we've organized some of our work uh, in our hospital to be focused on a alphabetical separation. We focus some of our work for our providers based on the geographic region, so I can sort by unit. Or I can also sort my rule type and group them in this rule type as well and have specialists within each grouping focused on those rules that are alerting across the entire hospital or health system. As a provider or as a user, I can establish which of those uh, filters I want to uh, activate and retain. Again, very important elements um, that were part of our vigilance application are 
reproduced here. So I can see which units I want. I can filter for the status of those rules. Maybe I want to see only those rules that have yet to be acknowledged, or I want to see only those that have been acknowledged um, or in a follow-up status. I can address custom rule groups for just a bundling of rule types and only uh, see those. So I can, again, ability to be more strategic about which rules I want to focus on. High level or low level priority, and then time frame. I can go back a month or I can re uh, reference only the last 24 hours of rules if I so choose. With the application, I can save these filters, and then the next time I come back to the application, um, they are retained for me. And that filtering takes what could be a very uh, complex list or overwhelming list of rules and alerts and trims it down to something that I might be responsible for um, as a, a provider for the day. And again, saving the alerts to my favorites and the settings are easily done. So the next time I come in, I can easily find and call up this um, grouping of alerts. To measure the benefits of that introduction of that technology, we looked at our time until verification of those um, alerts or acknowledgments. And across the board, with the exception of one of our facilities um, that, again, has a kind of a new process in place, we saw anywhere between a 10 to 24 hour reduction in the time it took to acknowledge those alerts. What was critical about that assessment is that the medium priority alerts showed the greatest reduction, meaning that our providers and our pharmacists were addressing alerts that were highly critical, still very timely, but they were putting to the side those other alerts that might have been as uh, time critical or as clinically um, critical, but we still had value in reviewing and addressing those alerts in the course of clinical care. And that second tier of alerts are the ones that, again, began to show the greatest benefit in time reduction, as well as completeness of the acknowledgement. So with that, we think we've realized the value faster. Um, these alerts um, are being addressed faster and uh, are improving the ability for us to intervene or intersect the care of a patient before they have the opportunity to advance to a full adverse event. With these technologies and these applications that are bringing information in to the right provider at the right time, what we're looking at now is where do we take this uh, opportunity next? And what are some of the lessons that we learned from our experience so far that we might be able to leverage as we move forward? So where we're thinking of going from here, certainly tools for risk stratification, and one particular tool that we are um, trying to build into our Illumicare ribbon, our Vigilante Alerting Platforms is our CDIP skill risk calculator. There are certain modifiable risks that can happen uh, or modifiable elements in clinical care that if a patient's uh, clostridium difficile risk is high enough, we could intervene on. So we want to present that information more readily to providers so that as the patient's risk begins to escalate, we can also weigh the risk benefit of certain therapies that uh, might contribute to the adverse event of having C. difficile. But again, having a reliable instrument that's accessible to providers when the risk is approaching that um, threshold for notification or concern is the element that we're working with these uh, applications to provide our providers. The ribbon, I think, presents a unique opportunity um, to be a instrument in communicating transitions of care support. The idea of moving a patient from the care setting, emergency department, ICU, acute care, ward and then to home is littered with uh, challenges, not only from kind of providers, but the medication management process is quite complicated. Um, and having clear sight and transparency on where a particular patient is and a particular medication of a patient's ultimate outpatient profile is in the process of being ordered 
for being confirmed as available and accessible to the patient in the outpatient setting is very important. There are a number of medications prescribed today that patients require prior authorizations in order for the pharmacy, outpatient pharmacy, to fill. Providers don't always know what those medications are, and there are steps that could be taken while the patient is in the hospital that can help alleviate that concern and address some of those elements ahead of time. But all that requires transparency and identification and knowledge of those particular areas of uh, medication need. So the Illumicare ribbon, Vigilance Learning, et cetera, being highly visible and uh, kind of prompting through the process for a particular patient can certainly help bring transparency to that transitions of care. Calling into the patient profile potential for coupons, for discounted medications, and getting that information to the patient before they transfer and before they leave the hospital, again, are key elements possibly to improving that patient's compliance with their medications and their adherence to what their ultimate medication regimen should be in the outpatient setting. The last element, uh, the prior two, I think, are very positive and framed in terms of what they can do for us. I think we have to be aware, though, that all of this potential pop-ups and nudging may have its detriments as well. Um, there's a concept that's being brought in from the technology literature called continuous partial attention. And so it might be preventing us from being inefficient, actually, the, the paradox of having alerts to respond timely to something may actually be creating inefficiencies in our ability to complete tasks and be on task for the full measure of time it takes to do something. So I think while we are benefited from these tools that bring information to the right time to the right provider, Again, we have to be cognizant of the fact that this constant nudging may have its detriments in terms of deep level efficiencies and thinking. What's unique and beneficial in the platforms that we have used to date is that they are quite customizable to the user. So I can turn it off or suppress the information nudging for a period of time so that, again, if I'm going to need a period to do some more extensive thought or uh, you know, a, a kind of a quiet period from interruption, I can do that as a user. And again, I hopefully can leverage the benefits of both um, the nudging and <clears throat> not have the continuous partial attention syndrome uh, impact my work. What we learned when we began to tie all these things together, and this is true, I imagine, from everyone's experience with comprehensive EMRs, is that formerly people who did not have to really interact with each other or communicate effectively or did not necessarily rely on each other to get their work done now have to in order to make the instrument useful. And the example with this particular case series really relates to the cost transparency piece. Um, once the decision is made to provide cost information to providers, you have to answer the question of which costs are you going to use? Are those going to be fantasy or fictitious uh, costs that are available through um, the average wholesale price that the hospital or the health system doesn't actually pay? Or are you going to represent really true costs? And the pharmacists that might be listening understand that the price isn't always the price. There are sometimes differences that go into contracting or rebates. And so understanding and trying to determine what that price is that you're going to reflect are relevant. How you represent a price of a product that is used three times a day compared to a product that is used once a day um, but covers the full 24 hours. How do you represent that information in a per tablet or a per day cost. And so these decisions 
needs to be made as you are building the structure to present this information to your providers. You have key stakeholders that uh, are interested in making sure that, again, the information is not misleading and driving in the wrong direction. But we also needed to have great vendor partnership on the bottom right. Um, those abilities with these applications as you introduce them to make changes to be responsive to your needs are critical in the success of these um, particular um, initiatives. And so you can't do any of the work that has been done without all of these considerations. And you definitely can't achieve the clinical efficiencies without actually talking with the clinicians who are using the instrument, observing how they're interacting with the platform, then trying to understand what their um, uh, benefits are, but also where they're having challenges with incorporation of the tools in their daily practice. Lastly, you really have to have a very strong change management culture and a communication plan. Um, you will want to modify the instrument quickly, um, and so having a key group of engaged providers uh, to pilot the program at the beginning who will not be frustrated if you're kind of making some rapid cycle changes are key. Uh, but then once you've got a platform that you think is uh, stable enough to be exported to more providers, you want to get that scale so you can determine whether you're going to get the benefits of the platform altogether. So really the final kind of lessons learned that we took away from this that I think when the platforms were brought to us in terms of the tying it together with the Illumicare ribbon, the driver was certainly present cost information and providers will respond to it and we will reduce our costs. And while we did see that in our experience, I believe the greatest benefit has really been with some of that integration of these solutions and workflows and greater efficiency and transparency and the safety alerting information that we used with our Vigilance tool, um, as well as the PDMP application, creating greater efficiency for the provider and a better overall experience in their um, interaction with the technology to take care of patients at the end of the day. So while the cost savings, I think, are there, um, our experience relies, I think, more heavily on the efficiencies gained with the PDMP, with the assurances and the benefits of the pharmacist alerting integration application right there within the EMR for the providers that live in that instrument their day to day. And with that, I'll close and leave you with my contact information. I'm available should you have questions about any of the data presented um, to the uh, throughout the talk today. And I uh, wish and hope that you found some value in uh, in the talk today. Thank you.